if you want to fly to Europe, you contact a travel agent and they help you work out the logistics of how to get there. Or you do it yourself, but it's really hard. Anyway, if you want to fly to somewhere in the solar system, then you contact the NASA equivalent and interplanetary travel agent. And my guest today is one of these. He's Dr. Damon Landau. He works at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, and he is the person that you will talk to if you want to figure out what orbits trajectories you're going to need to get your spacecraft to any destination in the solar system. And he's worked on plotting the trajectories to go to asteroids to Mars to various places around the solar system. And most recently, he worked out what kinds of trajectories it would take to be able to catch an interstellar object and actually have a rendezvous mission where you could orbit and analyze this object up close to get a sense of something that formed in an entirely different solar system. So our interview is great long range, we talk about just orbits in general, every extreme gravitational assist, and then we talk about what it would take to catch up with an interstellar object like Oumuamua or Comet Borisov. All right, here's the interview. I find thinking about orbital mechanics very non intuitive. Was there some moment in your mind when you started to think in ellipses? Ah, um, yeah, I'm I, I, I guess to begin with, I'm a very visual thinker. Uh, anyway, so when you know, so somebody comes to me and says, you know, I'd like to do a mission to to Mars. The first thing that I think about isn't necessarily the spacecraft. The first thing I think about is, okay, well, what does that that path look like? How, how do we get from Earth to Mars? What do we do when we're we're at Mars? Um, same thing for, you know, if we want to go to the out, outer planets, visit some of the, 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 the moons there, if we want to go to a comet or, or an asteroid. And sort of the interesting thing is, you know, one orbit or one sort of general trajectory family doesn't work for all, all, all of them. We have to take, take Taylor our approach to, to each. Um, so for, for, a, for, for example, to, to go to Mars, Mars is, you know, the next planet out in, in the solar system. So we don't have to go way out, out, out there. And so the, the orbit around the sun is more like an ellipse versus if we want to go uh, to, uh, for example, some of the in, in interstellar objects that have been coming through. Those things are screaming by. Mm -hmm. Those are um, on a uh, high, 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 high hyperbola. And so uh, with that, it's, it's a totally di different approach. Um, but the, 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 the thing that does help grant, grant, grant it all. So, you know, I mentioned ellipses and, and high, hyperbolas. And so to start with there, there are, you know, just sort of like a handful of basic kind of shapes that we can start with and, and play around. And that was actually my next question is like, what are the, what are the raw materials? You know, what are, what's in the toolbox that you have to get around the solar system? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I've, I've been de developing my, my, my toolbox for, for a while on this, you know, like, like any, uh, any, any good craftsman, you constantly have to hone, hone your, your, your act, you know, uh, and so, uh, there, there there's a bit of a, 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 a process that, um, that, that, that I've developed with, with others that, at, at J, JPL, where we start with sort of a simplified mo 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 model. So we, um know where the planets are in in in, in the solar system mm -hmm. and we know that when we're going in, in between the, the, the planets for the most part the spacecraft trajectory is only influenced by the gra gra gravity of the sun they're not really influenced by the planets themselves you know on 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 the trip they're just on sort of the end point and what we can do is you know use our best engineering judgment on what what kind of approximation can, can, can we take to simplify the problem a little bit in order to do this more broad uh, trade space exploration. So that's kind of the first step is we run things in a simplified model. We try to run through as much of the trade space as possible. So for for a, a example, when we want to look at missions to Mars, we might be interested in, okay, what's happening in the span of the entire 2030? So we, we might run, um, trajectories for an entire de decade in order to start to sift out sort of where the, um, you know, where the, the needle in, in the haystack is on, on a really good tra trajectory. 
And what are you looking for? Like, like I sort of think of an analogy, like if I'm planning a trip to Europe, right? then the first thing that I want to lock down is that flight from Canada to somewhere in Europe that's close to where I want to be. And then you've got all these different choices. You're like, you're this provider, that provider, these dates, those dates. And after a while, an answer comes out that is like, this is the one that's the the least terrible flight that has, you know, because, you know, the fewest layovers that I can afford, etc. And then once that's locked in, then I start thinking more about the details. Is that a good analogy? Yeah, that, that's a great ad, uh, analogy. And, and what, what you just de- described in sort of engineering speak is a multi-objective optimization pro- problem. And, uh, <laughs> right. Even on top of that, it's a constrained multi-objective optimization problem. So you you have constraints on you know when 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 when, when you want to fly. You're like you know okay your 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 brother's birthday is in June, so you know we're, we 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 we, we want to be you know somewhere for for that. Um, so we, 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 we do the same, same thing, um, on, on our end. So, um, some of the things are, are very clear, clear clearly, uh, analogous. We will give a, a, a window on the time that, that we want, want to leave. I'll, 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 a lot of the times, you know, that, that window isn't necessarily, um, go, go, governed by the physics of the solar system. It's more a pr- pr- programmatic thing of saying, we, we know that NASA is going to make a, a call for proposal sometime in the 2032, 2033 timeframe. So we start to hone in and look for launches there, the departures there. The other thing is how long it takes to, to get there. We want to, we don't want to take forever in order to get to the destination to get our our, our, our science back. So we look, look, look at the, the flight times as well. And so that gives us a box of sort of the um, the, the 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 time dimensions on 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 things. We we want to be in there. Um, the the other the, the the other main currency in sort of on on the trajectory and the space trajectory design is um, a, a, another uh, somewhat te- technical term is our delta v, which is shorthand for change in but ve- the ve- change in ve- velocity, and so that's sort of the equivalent of um, our uh, of, of 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 the distance um, that, that 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 it takes. We're we're not so much worried about. Um, you know the the actual distance itself. It's more how much change in speed do do, do we need the, the 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 rockets to perform, and that translates directly to how much propellant we need to bring on board, which translates directly to how big the spacecraft is going to be, which translates directly to how costly it's right. And so we we run through all the times we compare the the, de, the delta v. We'll plot one ver, ver, versus the the other. We'll go talk to the scientists and say, hey, which of these sort of looks good? So it's a it, 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 it iterative process where you bring in different stakeholders where each person sort of cares about a, a different part of, of this multi-objective optimization. And and that's for like the simplest flight. That's going from Earth to Mars. And and if you take the slowest path, if you take the fastest path, you're not going to have huge differences. But, but once you consider some of the other tools in the toolkit, if you're going to go farther out, you've got gravitational assists, you've got uh, Lagrange points, you've got various other factors that are, or, and, and the entry orbit that is requested by the scientists like that will have a factor as, as well. So, so how much more complicated does your job become as you think farther and farther away from, from Earth? Yeah, it's 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 funny, you know. It's um, we were actually just sort of talking about this the the, the other day at, at at work, sort of comparing us and, and uh, you know with 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 each other, and um, you know there, there there's kind of like a, a a fundamental truth where people will make things as complicated as as possible until it's too complicated for them to to, to work with, <laughs> um, and so it it, it 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 builds up. So yeah, as I was mentioning, we start on with the simplified model, but then. We, we can start to throw, throw in more more things. And so um, missions to the outer planets, for example, Ju- Ju- Jupiter or, or, or Saturn are good ex- examples of this, particularly um, NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. We're, we're going to launch a mission to a moon at Jupiter called U- U- Europa in, in, in a, a, a couple of years. And so with that, we, we look at using gravity assist to get out to Jupiter. But then it really gets fun when we start to look at the orbits at the 
at the planets the, themselves. And so um, you have to worry about the initial ca capture orbit at, 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 at the planet. How do you line that up um, in order to fly to fly by the moons of 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 in interest? Mm. Um, and so uh, again, with that, you you can start with a kind of simplified model, but then you 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 use that as sort of what we call the initial guess in, into our more sophisticated tools, and you sort of build up your fidelity that way. And and each each sort of mission has a different tool in, in, in the toolbox so when when we're ta talking about moons of um planets in the outer solar system a lot of times we work with resonances of of those moons where the spacecraft go go for, for example when the spacecraft goes around the planet like six times in the amount of time that it takes the the moon to go around eight times um or or, or something like that and so what that allows us to do is to repeatedly and 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 encounter the, the the moons and so we're, we start to build things up that way um so sort of using different math, math, mathematical constructs um that we found as engineers are very helpful to, to allow us to build these these trajectories and there's some really interesting orbits that i feel have been discovered fairly recently i think one of my favorites is the tess orbit right this one uh you know orbits in a way that is relatively stable and brings it back to Earth on a regular basis so it can transmit its data, but it's kept in lockstep thanks to the interactions with the Earth and the Moon. So are there some orbits out there that, that you are particularly fond of? Ah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I I, I guess I'm 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 part partial to the the orbit that, you know, gets gets the, the, the science return. So it, it's kind of different um for 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 each um i i i will say you know i i sort of mentioned the re re resonances be mm. before i i do find those just from sort of just you know kind of nerd out here from a mathematical standpoint like n n number theory seeing you know how, how we combine different integers of things to make everything line up and it really gets in interesting um when you start to look at um for, for for example, at Saturn, um, Enceladus and 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 Dione themselves. The, so those are two moons, um, two of the smaller I icy moons at, at at Saturn. So those are in a resonance with themselves. And then you add a spacecraft in there, and so you start to get. Um, I guess yeah, we call it a zizigy when um, resonances of different moons li line up. And and being able to sort of fit a spacecraft trajectory in there to repeatedly and 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 encounter the moons um that, that that really gets interesting same thing happens at, at jupiter with the galilean satellites those are in um resonances with, with themselves which um uh french mathematician La laplace first sort of found out figured out how, how that worked and so sort of just trying to understand so you can use those resonances of the moons to like stabilize the spacecraft's orbit or to shift its orbit in a way that is scientifically useful over time uh, we can use it to, to do both. So yeah, that, that, that's a great, great question. Yeah, you, you kind of hit, um, you know, so, so sometimes you want to, to stabilize the orbit because you're, you're trying to get repeated op, 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 observations. And so you, you can set up the, the resonance in such a way that it'll, that it'll um, keep the orbit sort of how, how you want it. And you brought up tests before. That's a, a great example of that where on every other orbit, the, the, the moon sort of perturbs the orbit left and then right. And so it sort of keeps the orbit um, set where you you want it. Um, we, 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 we can also use um, these re re resonance to repeatedly in, encounter and sort of change the plane of, of the orbit. And so uh, the Cassini trajectory at Saturn is a good example of that using Titan um, to change the, the in, in inclination of, of, of the orbit. And as, as you're doing that, you also sort of change where the orbit crosses the equatorial plane, which allows you to um, intersect different moons um, that that way. And so we, we can line up these different combinations and and pull pull them together in in, in such a way to to, to meet the, the scientific scientific objectives. There are some missions I think of like the is it Lucy, but this was done with the Galileo spacecraft that they didn't have enough delta v to reach their destination and so they used a gravitational assist of earth 
but that's where the spacecraft launched from. Right. So how how can a spacecraft use gravitational assist of Earth to be able to reach a destination with less propellant? Yeah, that's um, a, 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 a another sort of great um, or a, a cl 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 classic problem in, in or or orbit di dynamics and. Um, yeah, uh, you'll, you'll also sort of get a, a slightly different answer depending on which astrodynamicist you 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 you, you talk to. Um, but the the fundamental thing there, or is is what we call it a leveraging tra 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 transfer. So we leverage our speed from launch up to a speed at at at, at the flyby. So we'll, for example, we'll we'll depart Earth at like um, say five kilometers per per second. And then we, we we set it up again on a resonance so that it'll come back to Earth. And if we didn't do anything, if we didn't fire the thruster of the spacecraft, then we would come back at, at at pretty much exactly five kilometers per second again. And so that wouldn't really help us. But um, what what we do is um, sometime dur dur during that 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 tra transfer, most of the time it's near um, one of the, the, the apses of the orbit, either the farthest point from the sun or the nearest point to the sun will perform a small ma ma maneuver that will, um, change the eccentricity of the orbit, you know, how, how cir circular the, the orbit is. Mm. And what that does is when we re encounter earth, we're, we're, we're coming in at a slightly different angle and that angle to the, the earth also affects how much speed we have with, with respect to earth. And so, we, we 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 basically build energy into the system doing this maneuver. So when we come back to Earth, we have more energy with respect to Earth. So we leave at five kilometers per second. We come back at like eight kilometers per second. And with that, we we have this additional energy. We also use Earth to bend the um the 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 orbit. And what that does is it also kicks up the um the Apelian, which is the the far, farthest point from from the sun. So we, um, so so the uh, the the, the Ju Juno tra 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 trajectory to, to Jupiter, and also the the Lucy um, tra trajectory does this, where you launch and you barely get you know in in into the the asteroid belt. So you, you get out to maybe three a AU three um, time three astronomical units, you know, the distance from Earth to to the sun. And then when you fly by Earth, that kicks your your aphelion up so that you can eventually inter intercept Ju Jupiter or, in Lucy's case, the Jupiter tro tro Trojan asteroids. Right. So it, it's playing the the spacecraft energy with the gravitational energy of, of Earth. Right. So uh, like ellipses aren't perfect circles, and so you're going at different velocities along the ellipse depending on where you are when you think about comets getting going really fast as you get really close to the sun and then they slow back down. So you're, you're using a little bit of propellant to shift the shape of your ellipse. And then you're kind of multiplying that when you come back to the earth. Is that a multiple multiple factor? Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. In timing, where on the ellipse you are as you make it back to earth to to get that boost. It's, it's kind of interesting. And then I think about some of the using planetary flybys in reverse to be able to get closer to the sun. So you think about what's happened with, say, the Parker Solar Probe and the what was, what was done with the Messenger spacecraft in the past and the, say, the Solar Orbiter. So could you talk a bit about that, about about using planetary assists backwards? Yeah, um, it's it's uh... Yeah, the, my, my immediate thought is, you know, it's it's doing gra it, uh, gravity back, back, back backward. It, it, it really is kind of the opposite of, you know, what we were discussing, you know, getting out to the outer solar system. So um, basically, and in, in when you do your your, your flyby of, of the planet, so for example, you, you fly by Earth, instead of flying by the tra trailing edge of Earth as it circles the sun, you fly by the leading edge of, of Earth. And so that bends the orbit the other way. It takes energy out of the the orbit, um, in 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 this case, and um, and then when you take the energy out of the orbit, that means that the orbit will drop more, and you can do this repeatedly. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the these orbits that get very close to the sun or that eventually get to orbit around 
Mercury, um, yeah, we, we wanted to do sort of a, a series of, of steps down there. So first we might do a gravity assist of Earth, and then that will be just enough to nudge our orbit down to reach Venus, but we haven't quite reached Mer Mercury yet. And then we start to use Venus as our gravity assist engine, and we'll do a few fly flybys of, of Venus to kind of take the orbit from something that's entirely outside of, of Venus to something that's totally inside of Venus and eventually can in intercept, say, Mercury. And so um, that's, that's sort, sort of a, a, a another um, sort of tool that, that, that we have is to use the, the, the gravity of bodies, um, be they planets or moons, that sort of stepping stone um, to, to, to the destination that you eventually want to end up at. And is there any limit? Like, the sun is the hardest place to reach in the solar system, ironically, because, you know, we're on Earth, we're going 30 kilometers per second around the sun. And so we would have to remove that 30 kilometers per second to be able to drop into the sun. You keep missing the sun when you try to aim for it. But could you theoretically just keep canceling your orbital velocity and drive a spacecraft into the sun should you want to? Um. Yes, um, you know, sort, sort of the, the, depending on, you know, how, how much time you have. So all, all, the, all the take time and it does take propellant. And then um, ironically, the well, what, one of the lowest de delta V ways in order to get to the sun to, you know, actually intercept the, the, the sun is um, you actually don't go towards the sun first. You go out, you go up to right. Jupiter first. Um, and so you, you put a whole bunch of energy into the sun and then you fly by Jupiter. And what that does is it kills all the angular mo mo momentum. So it's it's going left to, to, to right and then you fly by Jupiter and then it's it's like stuck. And then it just <laughs> falls directly. It's, it's like you're holding the ball and you, and you, and you drop it and it just right. hits the floor. Well, it's, your spacecraft eventually just, you know, the sun is the floor of, of the solar system. Um, and so that's how you can get really close to the, 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 the sun. And if, if you survive the trip, then, you know, you get flung back, back out to like, you know, where kind of where, where you started up by, by Jupiter, sort of classic physics, you know, go down and you come back up to the same spot. That's interesting. Like I, I had read that you could go like on almost an interstellar, like an escape velocity from the sun, go right out to the very edge where your, where your orbital velocity is almost zero and then fall back down into the, you know, a minor nudge and then fall back into the solar system. But I, I hadn't thought of using Jupiter as a, as a kick. So it sort of save you that time having to go all the way out to the farthest perihelion possible. Uh, that's yeah. really interesting. What about this technique of using the sun to go faster, to go as close as possible to the sun and then fire your, your engines? Has anyone tried this yet? Could we use this? Ah, um, let's see. Yeah, I am not sure. There, 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 there probably is an example out there of, um, let's see, yeah, doing a close approach to the sun and then to to, to kick out. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if, if we've used it in practice, but um, it's 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 been known for a while. There's um, back back in the early 1900s. Um, there is a fellow by the last name of Ober who mm -hmm. um, was the first one to work out the math of, of how this works. So we call it the Oberth effect, where um, what happens is as, uh, as, as you get very close to the a, a gra 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 gravitational body, so as you're mentioning the ellipse, ellipses earlier, as as you get towards the, the the focus of the ellipse, the spacecraft speed speeds up, and then when you're going very fast. A small change in in your um, in, in 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 your velocity uh, given to you by the propellant on on your spacecraft is multiplied. So again, we're we're finding cases where we can sort of multiply the um, effect of the of, of the spacecraft propellant. So we get going as fast as as, as we can, getting near near the sun. We'll do a little bit of um, additional energy input from the spacecraft, but that. From an orbital standpoint, gives us a extra boost in terms of orbital energy, and so that's that's what what will allow us to really scream out towards um towards the the outer solar system even to space. Right, right, yeah, um, and and so I guess this idea of time, like if if time wasn't an issue, are there low energy like low delta v? 
pathways that you can take around the solar system? There, there, there are. Um, yeah. So there's there, there's also yeah. So so when when we when we start to think about okay, what happens if we take you know if, if we're not worried about time or even worried about sort of like human lifetime um, time, you know, uh, now we can start to think about um, which is actually one of the more fundamental scientific questions that um, you know NASA is looking into is what how did the solar system form? Um, and and it's it's tied because you know the 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 physics that affected spacecraft are the same physics that affected sort of the primordial uh so, so solar system and and so um when 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 you look at sort of a given energy level of a part, part particle being be it a particle of like asteroid or a particle of a a, a spacecraft um there are certain sort of uh energy levels that um can connect between different places in in in, in, in the solar system um so there there was a lot of um research look look looked into this i think it was probably about 20 years ago um one of my co colleagues martin low um mentioned talked about sort of the um uh, what was it the the so solar system or a interplanetary super high super yeah high i remember that um jump jump between so when, when you're looking at doing that with with the planets the time scales are very very long um they're lo longer than what we want to look at in terms of for a spacecraft but when you look at um systems that have a shorter time scale for example the moons that orbit J jupiter or, or saturn those moons have period on the order of of days um and in in, in that case you can make use of of these, um, we call them low, low, low energy tra transfers between the moon. Low energy because you're not really going that fast with respect to the moon in order to make the get, get the most use out of the gravitational potential um, of each moon and and where those potentials sort of connect to allow you to, to dance between the different. And so you could drift from moon to moon with the least possible propellant by following this interstellar or interplanetary uh superhighway yeah yeah um and and so that that's also sort of you know one of the classic traits that we, we all always look at so getting back to this sort of multi-objective thing you know we, we we care about how much propellant it takes and how much care about how much time it takes and um you 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 very seldom find a trajectory that gives you both you know permanent both it's right. always, always a trade you know pull one at one against the the other yeah. Now, you know, right now, humanity is headed back to the moon and people are thinking about Mars, but it's even easier to reach many asteroids. You did a study a few years back where you looked at the amount of Delta V that it would take to reach different asteroids in the solar system. And, and what did you find? Uh, yeah, so I found that there, there are sort of getting back to the, st the, the st stepping stone I, I, idea, and so there are a lot of asteroids near Earth. We call them near Earth a a asteroids. Some of them um, have orbits that are very similar to Earth, and some of them, you know, have orbits that are closer to Mars or even intercept Mars. And um, there's also a a whole bunch. There, there, there's a load of different asteroids out out there, and so we can use sort of the strength and, and numbers there to again sort of look at finding these needles in the haystack. So if you have a population of 10, 20,000 different asteroids, you can start to see which ones come near Earth at the right time and um, start to play out. Okay, well, it looks like something's going to be very close in 2033. Let's, let's go by this one. But if we happen to not, you know, get on, get, get on that bus. There's another one that's coming in, in 2035. Mm. So you can start to find, um, you know, for each sort of Delta B limit that, that, that you have, um, where these upgrades line up. And then as you get your Delta B higher, as, as you put more propellant on the spacecraft, get the more and more ambitious mission, you, you can start to, um, get upgrades that are, Far, farther out, um, you know, have longer dur durations and eventually build up the capability, um, you know, starting with missions that are closer to what you do at the moon of, of, you know, maybe on the order of a month, two things that you need for Mars, which are more on the order of like a year or two. 
So, so would you, I mean, they like drift relatively, like, as you say, they're fairly similar to Earth. So once you're in Earth orbit, the amount of additional delta V that you require is minimal, like far less than even going to the moon, even though the moon is right there. Right, and, yeah. And for, you could time the, things, right? So you would get sort of a mission of different durations, depending on what you're looking for. Yeah, and it's it, that's also an, an interesting point. Um, where whereas you, you're you're also the the other interesting um, characteristic that we that we look at when we look at asteroid missions is that asteroids themselves are small. They're they're not a big gravitational well, which means that. Um, you know, it's 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 not as much work once we sort of fly by them in order to um, land on, on on them. Whereas, you know, when we go to, to to the moon, as we get very close to the moon, the moon's gravity is going to speed up the, the the spacecraft, so you need to expend more propellant to to slow down. And so, yeah, that, that that's um, one of these sort of one one of many I, I, I ironies that, that you get when you look at these the asteroid di dynamics. And yes, um, even though the the asteroid is flying by Earth and not in orbit around Earth, sometimes it's easier just you know when 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 you look at the energy per perspective of you know let's just you know get the spacecraft on as close to an orbit as the asteroid, and then it's kind of easier to to close that that gap once you're near it. And I guess that idea of the ellipse, like because the asteroid is following an ellipse, it's moving at different speeds, you could have a situation where you catch the asteroid as it's, you know, you sort of reach ahead, reach the asteroid, but then Earth maybe laps the asteroid, and then you can leave the asteroid again, and make your way back to Earth. And, and not have to use very much propellant at all to make the the, the journey. Right? Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, there, there's this, um, again, bit, bit built, building up the, the complications of, of, of the mission. So now when we talk about these round trip tra tra trajectories, um, yeah, we, 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 we care about um, yeah, not only get, getting to the asteroid, but then we run a whole series of trajectories from asteroid back, 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 back to Earth. So, um, you know, it, it, it works both, both ways. And then we, uh, once we have these sort of da databases of trajectories out, databases of trajectories in, then we can compare which ones have a date time that is more than zero day, days and say, okay, well, this is one that looks yeah. like it, it might work for it. Now, did you work on the Lucy mission at all in, in plotting that course? I did not. No. Okay. Um, all right. All right. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm just so like the, I'm, I, I'm very familiar with, I, 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 I chat with the person who, who did work, work, work on it. Um, right. You know, but, yeah. but, but that, like that combination of, of seeing a couple of, asteroids in the main belt, and then being able to see multiple asteroids in one Trojan belt, and then a whole bunch more asteroids in the other Trojan belt at Jupiter, like that's just got to feel like a, an enormous amount of science that could be done comparative science. And I wonder like how complicated so I guess when you talk to them, how how complicated was this job of of figuring out how to get the most possible science out of these trajectories? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, so in, in, in my discussions with, with them, you know, I, I, I also, it, it, because it was such or is such a cool tra trajectory, um, also used it as sort of a test case to hone my, my, my own tool. So, you know, I, I have the software that, that I used to develop things and then I see, okay, well, somebody, you know, has this awesome trajectory. Let's see if, if my tool is, is able to do that. And of course, oh, interesting. Yeah, um, the first time you know you run it through it, 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 it doesn't. It, it you know it, it, it crops out. But then, <laughs> like, okay, well if, if if I tweak this and tweak that, then then, then it goes. And so that's sort of you know how how we build up our our, our capability. We um, you know see you know what cool things that other people are, are doing, and you know like 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 everybody else are like, hey, that's cool. I, I want to try it. Try it. Right? Could I pull um, that off? All yeah. right. So so your most recent paper, and this is the one that sort of had me drop you an email and see if I can interview and we haven't even gotten to that part yet is you're proposing that it could be possible to uh, intercept and rendezvous with an interstellar object. So I mean, how extreme are these objects compared to other stuff in the solar system? Uh, I would say that they are the most I I extreme. Um, you know, I, 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 I I've been working uh at, at at nasa for about 20 years 20 years now and i didn't even 
conceive that you know this type type of mission could could be possible even like a few few years ago. So the first of these interstellar objects um, is an asteroid called Oumuamua, and um, when when it, when it came came through, it, it kind of like opened up the eyes to a lot of the scientific community, and then that that tri trickles down to the engineering community because the scientists are like, hey. There's this really cool class of objects out there. Is there, you know, how how can we check check these things out? Um, and so, as as a good engineer, you know, I sat down and 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 think, think about it a bit, and I was like, well, you know, there are we we know ways of getting out to the the, the solar system. So these these objects, these interstellar objects, they they come from a different star. They do not originate in in our solar system. They're totally new. Um, and so that's, you know, the, the draw of them. And then the, the, the challenge is, you know, they don't start in our solar system, which means that they're not going to stay in, in our solar system. So they, they zip by and the height, the, the timing is very tight on, on these things. So, you know, it, it's, it's the opposite of, of our interplanetary su su superhighway. We're, you know, we're, you need to get on an express lane going quick to, um, wherever this thing going, go, going to be. And so we, we, we start to put, put, put together different con con concepts, sort of brainstorming, um, what, 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 what are the different ways of, of looking at that? And, um, you know, we, we, we always start, um, when, when we're doing a new mission with, with the, the trade space. And so I sort of listed out, well, here's all the different, um, tech technologies that I've heard about that, that might be kind of coming around the horizon. And, um, you know, with, with my background on uh, tra trajectory design, it's like, well, here's the sort of handful of, of trajectories that, that I know about. Let's start to combine the propulsion systems with the tra trajectory. Um, let's uh, talk with the astro uh, astronomy community to figure out, A, what types of orbits do we, do we think these things could be on? Right now, we only have two. Mm -hmm. um, we have a Muramura and Comet Borisov, but um, when, when we when we reach out and talk to the experts, they say, okay, well, here's what the the, the range of orbits might look like for these things, and here's how bright they, they, they might be. And so also fully, in order, you know, this isn't done in, in, in a vacuum. I have to talk to a lot of different experts to sort of see what's going on. And then um, using some of the techniques that we've developed in our mission concept development here at JPL, we go through all the we'll try to look through all the corners of the trade space and see what what pops out. And a, a, a few different promising art architectures sort of fell out of them. Well, so let's drill into each one of those assumptions that you're that you're talking about. So first, let's talk about their trajectories. So give us a sense like how fast are these things moving and and where are they tending to go through the solar system yeah so they are um they're screaming by at uh they so they're, they're they're going by faster than the the voyager spacecraft have have left so um for the for, for the most part we think in, in order to 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 get this type of of mission to work um, where, where we actually catch up to the object and can spend, um, you know, a decent amount of time in proximity to it. Um, we, we need to get a spacecraft going faster than the fastest spacecraft. Yeah. So we're, we're going to have to break a, we're going to have to break a record. Um, for, but for like, this. well, like when I think about, like, I know like the escape velocity of the sun is like almost what, 50 kilometers per second to leave the, like the solar system. So these have more right yeah right? they they um, are on an escape trajectory yeah yeah and and so yeah so you so you have to get the spacecraft going even faster than that and so yeah so the the other thing to you know sort of going back to our our, our classic physics here so yeah escape escape speeds yeah they order 50 kilometers per second but that means that when it's very far from the sun it eventually goes to to zero kilometers mm. per second it, it you know the the potential energy of the gravity of the sun pulls away all that speed now these objects are going so fast that even as they go infinitely away from the sun i'd say you know go to whatever the next star might be they're still tra traveling at se several kilometers per per second right um yeah so there so you, you have to kick up e even more speed just so that you have enough energy left over as you exit the gra gravity well of the sun you continue along a course with, and, with them. 
And is there any pattern to where they seemingly come from? So uh, that is a hot topic of re of, of, of research. So um, I, from what I've read and um, speaking with with some some of the experts, there there, there is thought to be a um, bias towards the direction where where, where they come. And so there's a a, a term I, I believe I'm using this correctly called the the solar apex. Which, if, if you if, if you expand your mind out even more, so not just the solar system, but now let's think about the sun as an individual star in our galaxy orbiting the, the the galaxy itself, you know, sort of mixed in with all these other stars. And as the sun or orbits, there's a um, there, 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 there's a re relative velocity of the star with respect of the sun with respect to other stars. And so it's thought that the these interstellar objects might be biased more towards this because it you know you can mm. sort of think of a um, you know a boat sort of going through the wa wa water you're going to encounter you know stuff you're going to encounter blossom on on the pond in the direction that that you're going in in your boat and so and, and so and so that and then that toolbox of propulsion systems. I mean, I'm assuming this just a plain old chemical rocket isn't going to be quite enough, or you just need a really big one. Right? Yeah, yeah. It would it would have to be a really big, really big chemical rocket if if you were to do it that that way. And so there's yeah. So so then we we start to look at well, what what different combinations would would work. And so yeah, we'll we'll start by by looking at more traditional propulsion systems. So the tried and true technology is, is chemical pur propulsion. We have a fuel, we have an oxidizer, we bur burn those to create an, an energy, shoot the exhaust out the back, and that's how how, how you get going. Um, and so that's very, um, you, you know, as a, a, a very well-known well technology, that's where we start, but it takes a lot of propellants to do that. The the, the my, my, miles per, per, per gallon on that, or I, I guess, you know, the kilometers per second per, per kilogram of propellant aren't um, as, as good do, using that. And so we, we also um, have uh, been de developing what we call electric propulsion mm -hmm. systems. And so um, uh, a, a, a good a, a example of this was the Dawn uh, spacecraft, which orbited the asteroid Vesta and, and Ceres in, in, in the asteroid belt. Um, they're also used you this propulsion this, this electric propulsion system is also used ubiquitous, ubiquitously on communication set satellites so um you know a lot of ge geo um, satellites have, have them and so the this is um very interesting in that it has it's, it's very efficient from, from a, a mass standpoint you, you get a lot of delta v per kilogram of propellant now the trade-off is that the thrust is very low on 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 this particular um from our propulsion system. So you have to do these very long, extended um, burns, I, I guess, yeah, you, you could call them, where instead of just burning for a few minutes or hours, it's months or even years that these mm. things can, can operate. But um, when you're looking at objects that are coming from outside the, the solar system, and if you're spending several years to catch up with them, you have the time to use this very efficient form of, of, of propulsion system, which um, means that you need to carry less propellant in order to um, match, match the uh, orbit of, of, of the object, which means that you can fit on a smaller launch vehicle and your spacecraft is smaller, which means that um, you have, it, it, it might cost less in, in, in the overall um, to do that. So you have to look at sort of all steps. Um, there. Was there anything else you looked at? Did you look at nuclear thermal rockets? Uh, yeah, I, I, I did look, look, look into those as, as, as well. Um, and so when, when we look at, um, you know, what, what might be available in the near term, uh, we, we do think that the nuclear thermal rocket technology will be, um, uh, uh, available. I, 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 I know that, um, DARPA, the, 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 the defense, um, you know, research branch, is, is look, look, looking to do some some testing on on those. Um, I believe I, I read in the news some sometime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of, I think they're planning to launch one by 2028 with yeah. NASA. Yeah, and so um, that so so that technology itself, I I believe it's going to be uh, available soon. Now the 
Rub for using that technology for the application of catching up with these objects is on, on these trajectories that they take several years. Um, the, the, the issue isn't um, with the nu nu nuclear propulsion system itself, it's in the pro propellant. So these propulsion systems um, generally use uh, li liquid hy hydrogen as, as a pro propellant. Um, there, there are uh, other op options out there, but the, um, I, I believe that all, all the options sort of re rely on a uh, very cold, a cryogenic uh, uh, fuel um, or propellant in order to make it work. And storing um, li liquid hy hy hydrogen in space for years upon end, um, I, 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 I think that that's, that's sort of the, the push um, right. far for this particular te technology. Um, not so much in, in that the te the technology itself is, is um, you know, out, out, out of reach. I, I, I believe that we could do that. I, I don't think that um, you know, the, the policy is in place to develop the technology for that. I, I believe that they're looking for that for more um, uh, human missions to the moon and Mars. And so those, you know, you might need to store the propellant for uh, a few years, maybe three or four years at the most, whereas, you know, the trajectories we're looking at for these interstellar objects are more like 10 years. And so we might not actually develop the technology for that. And so were there any other technologies you looked at or mainly you, you looked at chemical and and solar electric propulsion. Yeah, so so when it comes to the uh, uh, electric propulsion, yeah, so I'm I'm, I'm glad we uh, yeah, you you mentioned that. And so there's there's also two flavors of the electric propulsion. So there's the electric thrusters themselves, and those are 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 more or less agnostic to how they are are powered. And so you mentioned solar electric propulsion. So that's the technology that um, you know we we, we have to, to today. That's that's what's flying. But as we go very far from the sun, as you imagine, mm. the solar panels don't pr produce it as, as much, and so it's harder to run the clusters. And so the the te technology that, that that I also looked into is using nuclear electric propulsion, where um, so with a nuclear thermal rocket, as we were discussing or, or earlier, that uses um, th thermal e e energy, heat, in order to to make the propellant. Um, uh, go, you know, to, to, to shoot out. Whereas uh, you can also use this nu nuclear e energy to create electricity. And um, Na Na NASA is looking into for its missions to the moon and, and eventually Mars um, to, to use uh, nuclear fission power for the, the, the to power the, um, the, the on, 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 on the on the surface. So where the astronauts might eventually land, um, you know, we, we need that sort of um, long dur dur duration power source that also happens to give you the same power no matter how far you are away mm -hmm. from the sun. So we can bind this nuclear electric power source with an electric propulsion thruster in order to to get um, the thrust that, that we need, even, you know, out at the distance of ne ne Neptune and, and, and Pluto to catch up um, and, and eventually get into close proximity to any interstellar object. So what did you conclude when you sort of looked at all of the trajectories that you may have to follow and all of the technology that you have to work with to solve this engineering problem? What what solution did you come up with? Yeah, so, um, you, you know, there, a, a, a good engineer always has plan, 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 plan B. So yes. um, there's, you know, it, it sort of de de depends on where, you know, the technology development goes in the next few years. But if, um, you know, Nat NASA continues to de develop this nuclear power source, I do think that's the, the best bet um, in, in, in order to, to do this, which I also, I, I, I really li like this. And this sort of harkens back even when I was doing my 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 graduate work, looking at what, how 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 can we leverage the technology that NASA is uh, investing in to make you know human exploration of space possible, leverage those technologies to also help out the the inter interplan interplanetary exploration um, using robotic spacecraft, and so being able to leverage this this power source in order to for inter interplanetary for, for, for trajectories, I think that um, allows us to make a a, a spacecraft that um, uh, doesn't, um, you know, for, for, for the for the size of the spacecraft, 
it'll, it'll be able to reach the widest variety of of of, of these in, interstellar objects. Um, yeah. So my my uh, analysis went out to um, twenty five to up to forty percent of these objects that come through. If you do have nuclear electric propulsion technology, you'd be able to rendezvous with them. Hmm. Uh, they stay in close proximity. Um, if if we don't have this, um, you, you know, tech, tech, this tech, tech technology, um, for example, it becomes too difficult to transition it from surface power to, to powering a, a, a spacecraft. Then um, we sort of go back to, um, I guess, you know, I, I call it like more of a brute force where we just throw a bunch of chemical propulsion at it launch on a lar larger launch vehicle. So there we have to leverage the investments and in, like the, the, the SLS, which, you know, just had its main, main flight, you know, a few, few months ago, um, or perhaps SpaceX's Starship, one of these giant rockets might be able to help with that. Um, I, I, I will mention one of the interesting things that I, I found out lo lo looking in, into this is um, it also, it, it's not just the technology, but it's it's how you you, you use it. And I also found that um, where we stage the, the rockets also um, huh. I, um, comes into play. And uh, in, in, in the case of an interstellar object, um, I, I, I do ad I advocate first launching the spacecraft to Earth orbit and have it wait in, in Earth orbit um, with, 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 with a kickstage so that once you actually observe the object, you're already launched from, from Earth you're ready to go, and it takes only a few months to sort of line up the, the trajectory, so that when you do your, your kick stage out from Earth, you, you can um, you, you can catch up with the object. And the the, the reason there is um, there's a very short window of only a few months between when you observe the object and when it's um, going to eventually, you know, go through the inner solar system and come off the way out. So you. Um, we really need to be on on, on the ball. Um, you know, right. you, you you have to wait until these things come and zip out. And this is similar. Like I know the European Space Agency is developing an interstellar object intercept interceptor. So this is something that would wait at say the L two point for some object that's on an appropriate trajectory, and then it'll attempt an intercept, but not a rendezvous, not go into orbit and collect data over the long term, but just do a quick flyby and take some pictures and send them home, which is dramatically different. So so let's kind of put this together then sort of in your imagination. Uh, and, you know, we know that that NASA has no plans currently to to send a mission like this. But, you know, just in our imaginations, what would this mission look like? It's like, someone has approved, okay, yeah, we, we do want to rendezvous with an interstellar object. How does this work then? A spacecraft is a chemical or uh, talk me through this. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, so, so you, you, you started off with, with step one is, you know, to, to get, uh, the policy makers in, in, in interested in, in yeah. so somebody I mean, has well, to be unanimously. Interested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not Tom Wolf Road, you know. No, no bucks, no buck, buck Rogers. So, <laughs> right. so we, we 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 start there, and then um, you know uh, we we sort of you know, see if which which te te technologies we want to push to 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 be the developed. And so, if we, if we follow this nuclear electric propulsion path, we um, we we start to look at okay, well, what 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 if anything do we need to do to retrofit these surface power reactors for um, use in, in, in space. And, and so we, we start to do that technology development on the on, on, on the ground. Um, the, the other thing that, that we do is we start to, again, negotiate with the, the, the top policy makers on saying, OK, we want to build a spacecraft, but we don't have a target for it yet. We have right. a type of target and um, the, 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 depending on what what we find, so the uh, Vera Rubin, Ob Rubin Observatory is um, set to be on um, getting its first light. Some, some sometimes soon. I'm not re really yeah, sure. later this year, early next year. Yeah, um, and so if, if if we start to see these objects coming by, you know, like maybe once a year, once every other year, then we have some confidence that once we do build the spacecraft, 
we'll have you know something to 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 go to and so we 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 build up the consensus that that way that okay this mission's worth do, doing so that's that's sort of you know the first thing is to get the people on board and then uh and and then we um you know do the sort of nuts and bolts in, in engineering we de develop the the, the spacecraft we, we build it um and then we launch it from, from earth I, I i recommend um putting it again into this sort of high earth orbit um at earth so this is an orbit that would intercept um the the the, the, the moon but not um you know not not until we actually need it to so it, it, it it'll out it'll go far farther than the moon but then come in and you know and it's also um not trying to in or, or going through the the out the radiation belt at, at, at earth so we're able to keep it safe um in, in in orbit for a while and then we we, we wait um we, we 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 wait until the vera rubin ob observatory says okay here's an, an object co coming in oh look at this it, it looks like it has a, a tail let's get everybody to look at it and say okay well what's going on this is a, a comet and then um we get all the um the ob observers around the earth to, to look at it you get a fit on on the orbit the first time you you, you see an object, the, the fit for the orbit generally is very poor. Like you don't know um, how close it's going going to get to the sun, and even, even less um, you, you you know sort of what time the the, the time the, time, the timing of, of everything is, is going to be. So you 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 look at the, the comet for a a a, a a couple of months, um, get 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 a trail on it, and then. Um, once once you sort of know what the orbit of the, the comet is you compare that to the capability that you built on board of, of your spacecraft if if it looks like it's the go then um you know you go to set someone like, like like myself or somebody in my group to run the trajectories we'll say okay well here's here's what we need need to do and then once um we we, we, we calculate the the right time to, to launch it's usually sometime near that comic period to the helium um we do the the, the burn start start going we turn on our nuclear electric propulsion system have it slowly nudge towards the 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 the, the, the comet um the 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 other thing that um is really in, enabling for this is um harkening back to get a guided system from jupiter Jupiter, as we know, is the largest planet in the solar system. It also is the best gravity engine in, in the solar system. So we um, have the spacecraft actually fly by Jupiter first. Um, even if Jupiter is a bit out of the way, after you fly by Jupiter, it will turn it so that you are now going on the way um, mm. toward, toward, toward the, 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 the comet. Um, continue to have your electric propulsion system nudging it and um, 10 to 15 years after launch, we're able to get in proximity with it and, and um, you know, get up close and, and personal and see what's going on. But and, and that's the time frame you're thinking are, is like 15 to 20 years of chasing to actually catch up to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I limited the, the search to a max of like 20 years. Um, thinking just sort of thinking about what are the, um, you know, the current, Limit limitations of spacecraft, and actually not as much the limitations, the qualification limit of, of the spacecraft. How much have we actually tested spacecraft to be able to survive? Um, and so, yeah, it it, it it turns out that you know, uh, I'd say 10, 10, 10 to fifteen years is probably the, the time frame if, if if you really want to be able to have a good chance of running in the planet. And it feels like there's overlap in in this idea and some of the other missions that are being considered. Like there's this idea of the interstellar mission that NASA is considering to send a spacecraft out into essentially the same environment to examine what's outside the 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 close what's outside the inner solar system. And so you're looking at like getting out to say a thousand astronomical units. And then the other mission, of course, is to try and get out to say the solar gravitational lens, which is at about a thousand astronomical units. So it feels like there's a lot of overlap. You could probably do a bunch of related research with one mission. Yeah, that's, um, you know, that, that's where, where things get fun is, is where you look for, um, yeah, so we call it sort of opportunistic science so you know you, you have a mission doing one thing but you know on on the way out 
we we see that uh, yeah, we, it's it's eventually going to be out. If we get to a set out in AU, let's let's make sure you know it might not be that much of a delta cost to add an instrument that that does sort of the particles and fields that you want to do out there, or 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 to to get in, in, in imagery if you do get out to the um, to, to to the solar. Uh, gravity lens. Um, you're, you can also do really interesting scientists on the way out, as, as you're going out, look for, um, there, there, there's a, um, a special class of, of comets called centaurs that or, orbit um, out, outside the or, orbit of Saturn, but sort of inside the orbit of Neptune. So if you're going through there, if you have a, a good uh, camera on, you can sort of start to look, look, look for different objects. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, what about a sample return? Did you do the math on what it might take to be able to bring a piece of an interstellar object back to home? Um, yeah, I, I, I did look, look, look into that a, a, a bit. Um, and so, uh, again, you know, getting this, the, the sample home is sort of, you know, what you just have to do what you just did in, 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 in reverse. So if it takes yeah. like um, 10 to 15 years to get out there, it's going to take about that long to get back. So now we're looking at like a, 30 year mission, the propellant goes way up because, um, yeah, the, the, uh, the, the Delta V for a spacecraft goes, um, is, is an exponential push on how much propellant you have. So, so basically all the propellant that, 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 that you need to return the, the sample back, that is all going to multiply the propellant to get out because you have to carry all, all, all this extra mass. What I do think would be a a, a uh, feasible way of getting a sample um, is is to do what what we did for uh, the Stardust um, mission, which um, I, I think that's probably about 20, 20 years ago now, where mm -hmm. we uh, had a spacecraft fly by a, a comet. We used a, a, a substance called a aerogel to capture particles that were coming out out, out of that comet. Um, and so I, I think that, that we could do a flyby mission. So, so I, I think the best way to get a sample back to Earth of an interstellar object is um, instead of landing on it and getting a big, big sample, to do a flyby if it's um, of an active ob object, get some of the sample that's for the material that's naturally um, coming off the, the, the surface and have it on, on, again, one of these resonant trajectory so that when it flies by the comet, it's in resonant with earth so right. it events back to earth so or like end. dart where you where you impact it release a cloud fly through the cloud gather the samples and then bring that back to earth yeah yeah so so dart yeah, yeah the, the 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 dart um a, a, a approach for a non-active object would be great yeah you make a plume fly through the plume that 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 always comes up as um you know, one one of the ways to try to get something off the surface, especially if you want to get something that's not just scratching the surface of of, of an object. If if you have an, an impactor, it can it can push stuff up from a few meters deep. Do you, when you think about orbits, just in the Milky Way itself? I mean, obviously now we're shifting deeply into science fiction land. Right. Are there any interesting trajectories that we could use? I mean, if power was no obstacle if budget was no obstacle you know could we use these these methods either the slow moving ways waiting for stars to get close to earth or finding rogue planets in between or dwarf stars in between us and other places um or maybe doing gravitational assist with black holes like can you expand out what you've mastered for the solar system to the milky way to, to an extent, yes. I, I mean, the physics for the most part still holds. So you know, we we we, we can use we use the same equations, you know, to to work yourself through a complex gra gra gravity field around a planet as you would be com to navigate through a complex gravity field in a galaxy. Um, and and we 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 actually um, did look, look into this a little bit. We we gave ourselves a toy problems since so, so several years ago. So all the trajectory nerds, counting myself, has has one of them. Um, and, and every few, few years, we, we we put out a um, a problem. We call it the Global Trajectory Optimization Competition. Oh, and, that's cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, G, G, G talk for for short. So yeah, if, if you want, you can Google GTOC and you'll you'll, you'll, you'll find it. And, uh, one of the um, 
what, what, one of the problems that, that, that we worked on was how could you eventually um, seed the, the solar system with, with spacecraft? Um, and, and, and so the equ equations, you know, we were able to use some of our tools for that. Um, where things do get interesting, so you mentioned, you know, um, doing like a gravity system off, off of a, a, a black, black hole. So once you're doing that, you get these relativistic uh, uh, effects. And so, um, you know, I, I, I personally haven't looked at that since grad school um, because, you know, I, we don't really need it for, for the day the day, day to day. But yeah, we can certainly take, take it, advantage of, of those things. And to some extent, like... We, we do, to in order to navigate the spacecraft that we're navigating now, we do actually need to take into account relativity because, you know, the time, you know, runs a bit s s slower, you know, depending on where you are in the gravitational field, which means that, um, you know, if, if, if the clock on the spacecraft is going different than your clock, clock at Earth, then things are going to be off. And so we account for, for all of that. So, um most of the physics re required for, as you mentioned, this sort of interstellar exploration is in, in in our toolboxes now. It just hasn't been, you know, exercised to the extent. That does your Does your software handle it nicely? If you plot a a gravitational assist near a black hole, or does it uh, does it kind of freak out at you? It, it it would produce a solution, but it would produce the wrong one because I, yes, I don't have all all the relativistic effects the, yeah. the, my, the my stuff yet. But I wonder, like I think about, like if if humanity lasts for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years, then time starts to be on our side again. And you think about stars getting closer and farther to the sun, that there are opportunities to to hop from star to star, if you're willing to be patient, just wait 70,000 years and you can, you can reach That'll a nearby be. star because it's going to come close to us. So. Yeah, yeah. And so that yeah, that that's, you know, that's a very similar idea of what we were discussing before about the asteroid, you know, there are there are asteroids out there that every once in a while get near Earth. And you know, we wait for them to come. Um, you know, it, once we start to think about things on more of a galactic time, time scale, it's the same thing. Sometimes stars come come near near Earth, and and it, you know, if we're ta talking about trajectories that last thousands of years, then you know, we went to take that into account as as well. You know, it's 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 the traveling salesman for problem, but you know, everything sort of move moving around right yeah totally uh well damon it's been a fascinating conversation um if people want to follow your work what's the best place to do that oh um that's a good question uh I, google I, scholar I, uh google, google scholar is probably probably the, the best thing yeah I, I i i don't i don't really have my um i don't really have the like a Twitter or an Instagram. That's no, good. Good. I, um, I recommend that. That's why you're getting scientific papers done. And, and so keep it that way. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. Uh, I look forward to that mission. And when it does get approved, will, will you let me know? Oh, you'll, you'll, you'll be the second person to know after, after me. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right. Thanks, David. You're welcome. You can get even more space news in my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word, there are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at university.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at university.com slash podcast, or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to David Giltonan, Maud Sue, George, Jeremy Matter, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verabayoff, Josh Schultz, and M. Drew Gross, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us. <laughs>